Welcome to today's Zoom event, A Painter in Search of an Audience, Marie-Louise von Mojeczyski in exile in our series, Flights of Five, Stories of Artists on their Repression. I'm Rachel Stern, Director and CEO of the Fritz Usher Society for Persecuted, Ostracized and Banned Art based in New York. We research, discuss, publish and exhibit artists whose life and work were affected by the German Nazi regime between 1933 and 1945. With this work, we commemorate their lives and achievements. <clears throat> Ines Schlenker is an independent art historian with a special interest in national socialist, degenerate and emigre art. Hitler's Salon, her study of the officially approved art <clears throat> I'm sorry, in the Third Reich, as shown at the Great German Art Exhibition, was published in 2007. She wrote the catalog resume of the paintings of the Vienna-born immigre Marie-Louise von Mateczynski uh, in 2009, co-edited the artist's correspondence with the writer Elias Can Canetti in 2011, and curated the exhibition at Tate Britain, London, that celebrated the opening of the Marie Louise von Matuszewski Archive Gallery in 2019. Recent publications include Capturing Time, a study of the life and work of the emigre artist Milene Kosman in 2019, and Chagall 2022. She's a member of the committee of the Research Center for German and Austrian Exile Studies. After the talk, there will be time for Q&A, so please post your questions in the chat or the QA function. And now I'm honored to welcome Ines Schlenker. Welcome, Ines. Rachel, thank you very much for the kind introduction. And it's, it's a wonderful, great pleasure and honor to be here. <laughs> thank you. Let me try and share my PowerPoint. Marie-Louise von Matuszewski was an artist whose life spent almost the entire 20th century. Her works were produced over a period of seven decades and ranged from the first small oil painting, Small Roulette, painted in Vienna in 1924 when she was only 17, to still life, Vase of Flowers, which she was still working on in 1996, shortly before her death in London. Her oeuvre includes over 300 paintings mainly portraits, self-portraits and still lives, and several hundred drawings. For a long time, however, Motoshitsky did not receive the attention she deserves. This was partly owing to a natural shyness. All her life, she found it hard to expose herself to the public gaze and had difficulty parting from her pictures, which were like children to her. Rather than spending time and energy in achieving a fame that might prove ephemeral, she wanted to produce new and better works, once summoning up her ambition, quote, if you could only paint a single good picture in your lifetime, your life would be worthwhile. The main reason for her long absence from the art historical records, however, is the radical political change brought about by national socialism in Central Europe, which destroyed her promising career before she had reached full maturity. Forced into exile, she had to rebuild her life in England. Being privileged enough not to have to earn a living, she was never under economic pressure to make money from her paintings. Thus, her art developed away from the public eye, independent of current trends. She managed to show her work in a substantial number of both solo and group exhibitions, yet still remained relatively obscure until in 1985, the solo exhibition at the Goethe Institute in London brought her much deserved public attention and critical acclaim, leading to Motoshitsky being recognized as one of the most important emigre artists in her new homeland. Marie-Louise Motoshitsky was descended from a wealthy, aristocratic Jewish family that played a vital role in the intellectual and artistic circles of Vienna. Many male members of the family, such as the philosopher Franz von Brentano and Robert von Lieben, the inventor of the amplifying wall, distinguished themselves through scholarship. Others became well-known patrons of art and science and generous supporters of charities. Some female members, 
often artistically talented, were famous as hostesses. Sophie von Tedesco, for example, marie Louise's great-grandmother, organized high society events at the splendid Palais Tedesco. Situated opposite the Viennese court opera, it was filled with a celebrated art collection. Sophie counted painters like Morris von Schwind and composers like Johannes Brahms and Johann Strauss among her friends. Her daughter Anna von Lieben played a notable role in the history of psychoanalysis for being one of Sigmund Freud's earliest and most important patients. Under the pseudonym Cecilia M, he gave her a prominent place in his studies on hysteria. In 1906, Marie-Louise was born to one of Anna's daughters, Henriette, who had married Edmund von Motuschitsky, the son of a Hungarian aristocrat. Sadly, Edmund, gifted cellist, died already in 1909. Marie-Louise and her elder brother Karl grew up in a spacious flat in Vienna. Summers were spent on the large family estate in Hinterbrühl, a village in the Vienna woods. It comprised the grand Villa Todesco, fruit and vegetable gardens, meadows and woodland, a swimming pool, a tennis court, and to Oriette embodied all that was good in life. Around the time Motoshitsky, aged 13, left school, she met the person who would become the most important influence on her work, Max Beckmann. The German painter was introduced by Irma Simon, a relative of the von Lieben family and wife of Heinrich Simon, the editor-in-chief of the Frankfurter Zeitung. The teenage Motoshitsky, having recently discovered her passion for painting, visited art schools in Vienna, The Hague, Frankfurt and Paris. During her stay in the Netherlands, she met Mathilde von Kaulbach, a daughter of the Munich-based painter. In 1923, Mathilde von Kaulbach arrived in Vienna to pursue her singing career, staying with the Motoshitskis. It was Henriette who invented the famous nickname by which Mathilde von Kaulbach would become known, Quappi, inspired by the surname's closeness to Karl Quappe, tadpole. And it was Marie-Louise, who first introduced Quappi to works by Beckmann, of which she possessed a few and subsequently to the artist himself when she visited the Motoshitskis in 1924. Quappi became Beckmann's second wife just one year later. The close relationship between the newlyweds and Motoshitsky soon bore artistic fruit. In Zwei Damen am Fenster, Two Ladies by the Window, a double portrait of Quappi and Marie-Louise Beckmann records their friendship. Motoshitsky's early works, such as Self-Portrait with Comb of 1926, are clearly inspired by Beckmann's paintings. In 1927, he invited Motoshitsky to attend his masterclass at the Städelschule in Frankfurt. In her choice of Beckmann, whose paintings most of her compatriots would have considered perfectly hideous as teacher, Motoshitsky was unique among her fellow Austrian artists. It placed her at the cutting edge of modern art. She spent a year studying with Beckmann in Frankfurt and then over the next decade, steadily carried on painting in Vienna and Hinterburg. Gradually, she shook off her teacher's direct influence and developed her own distinctive, lighter style and subject matter. She finally overcame her reluctance to show her pictures in public in 1933, when two works were included in an exhibition of the Hagenbund, an avant-garde artist association in Vienna, an unidentified still life and the balcony, a courageous self-portrait painted on the balcony of the Villa Tedesco. While one critic singled out her work, quote, we should further add laudably M.L. Motoshitsky, unquote, and another praised her for her inventive choice of subject matter, she was so devastated by one negative review that she subsequently refused to show her work in her native country, a resolution she would stick to for over 30 years. Motoshitsky's world was turned upside down in March 1938 when the National Socialists marched into Austria. Although uninterested in politics, she had followed the rise of the Nazi party in neighboring Germany with trepidation. It had also made her aware of her Jewish roots, something that had never mattered in her life before. Panic-stricken at the Anschluss, she fled Vienna for the Netherlands the day after, taking her mother with her 
and traveling on Czech passports. One of Matuszewski's most beautiful and iconic works was created during this, this first stage of her journey into exile. The enigmatic, elegant self-portrait with red hat, in which she pays tribute to a lover left behind, commemorated in the mask-like dark profile on the right. She also set about helping the struggling Beckmans, who had emigrated to Amsterdam after the confiscation of his works from public collections in Germany and the inclusion of almost two dozen of his paintings and prints in the infamous Munich exhibition of degenerate art in 1937. She persuaded Ilse Lehmbrunnen, an aunt who lived in the Netherlands, to support the couple financially by purchasing some of his paintings. Shortly after her first solo exhibition in The Hague in January 1939, which attracted much attention and was favorably received by the press with reviewers praising her fresh and fascinating talent, Motoshitsky decided to emigrate to England with her mother. One painting of 1940, The Travelers, refers directly to the experience of exile by recording her recent crossing of the channel in a wooden barge that drifts helplessly on a stormy sea, four vulnerable passengers huddled together. Their flight must have been sudden, since they were clearly not able to dress properly or bring many, many belongings, apart from a mirror and a large sausage. As the painting originates from the artist's own experience of exile, the passengers have been interpreted as members of the Motoshitsky household. Her wet nurse, her mother, her brother or uncle, and the artist herself. Yet the generalized title succeeds in depersonalizing the four evacuees and allows Matuszewski to express the universal emotions triggered by a sudden and enforced journey into exile. In contrast to Matuszewski, her brother Karl had refused to leave Austria, where he had returned to in 1937 after spending several years in Scandinavia as a disciple of the psychoanalyst Wilhelm Reich. Karl was determined to provide resistance and to save the Hinterbrunn estate from falling into the hands of the Nazis. At weekends, his anti-fascist and Jewish friends would meet in the relative safety there. In the autumn of 1939, Karl founded a resistance group with friends. Three years later, while helping two Jewish couples from Poland escape to Switzerland, it was denounced. Karl was arrested by the Gestapo and sent to Auschwitz. He kept his spirits up by asking for his cello to be sent to him, but soon fell ill and died on the 25th of June 1943 in the prisoner's infirmary. Although Motyshitsky learned of Karl's death via a letter from a Swiss relative in October 1943, she later claimed he had died just a few weeks before the end of the war, which would have made his loss even more futile since it could almost have been avoided. Marie-Louise had always been Karl's confidant and ally since he had not been close to his mother and often felt misunderstood by her. For the rest of her life, Motyshitsky felt guilty for not having been able to save him. In After the Ball, painted in 1949, she pays a touching tribute to her brother. She depicts him with his Norwegian girlfriend, Argot, after a fancy dress ball in Vienna. Although both are exhausted from the evening's entertainment, they tenderly and protectively hold each other in a moment of brief happiness. Back in 1939, Karl had sent on Modeschitsky's early paintings, as well as a substantial proportion of the contents of the Viennese household, including many pieces of furniture, plates, cutlery, linen, books and artworks. The Motoshitskis were thus able to recreate the familiar living environment in exile, albeit on a more modest scale. First living in London and from 1940, in the hope of escaping the Blitz in Amersham and Buckinghamshire. Motoshitsky later conceded that despite the war, quote, although it sounds crazy, this to some extent was really a very nice time, unquote. They moved in circles of fellow emigres intent on upholding cultural and intellectual standards, renewing old friendships, for example, with the Austrian painter Oskar Kokoschka, who had arrived in England in October 1938 and created this portrait of Motoshitsky in 1940. 
Although Kokoschka never instructed Motoshitsky formally, he was generally allowed to see her latest work or even work in progress, and he made no secret of his views on her paintings. Motoshitsky always took his criticism of her paintings to heart, yet refrained from following him further, since she considered his pupils to be pale imitations of their teacher. More importantly, his criticism, always frank, yet sometimes harsh, hurt Motoshitsky deeply, as a diary entry on the 8th of May, 1948 shows. Quote, it is peace. Kokoschkas appear. Kokoschka is awful with my painting of mother, unquote. When it was forthcoming, however, his praise for her work was eagerly taken up, and under his tutelage, Motoshitsky's brushwork became progressively freer. Later in life, she counted Kokoschka among her Hauptgötter, her main gods, the four people who had meant most to her, alongside her mother, Beckmann, and Elias Canetti. In Two Women and a Shadow, Motoshitsky subtly depicts a lifelong friendship that was not without its difficulties. Motoshitsky and Olga Kokoschka are prevented from having a confidential conversation by the presence of Oskar Kokoschka, whose distinctive profile can be made out between them. Around the time of her move to Amersham, Motoshitsky embarked on a turbulent, lifelong relationship with the writer Elias Canetti. Fleeing Vienna after the Anschluss, Canetti and his wife Vesa had now found lodgings with Gordon, Gordon Milburn, a retired Anglican priest, and his wife, who lived in nearby Stubbswood, where Motoshitsky had stayed some months earlier. Father Milburn was to inspire the work of both the Canettis as well as of Motoshitsky. In Party in Blitz, Party in the Blitz, the fourth part of his autobiography, covering his years in England, Elias Canetti devoted a whole chapter to the idiosyncrasies of his landlord. Vesa Canetti bitingly caricatured the couple in a short story, characterizing them as mean and riddled with double standards. While the Canettis present an ambivalent, if not downright negative picture of Gordon Milburn, Motoshitsky is more lenient. Her portrait, Father Milburn, painted in 1958, shows the by then aged priest as a quiet authority whose earnest seriousness is palpable. In 1941, the Motoshitskis acquired a three bedroom house at 86 Chestnut Lane, Amersham. Cornerways possessed a large garden in which the family kept chickens and grew vegetables. Since Canetti's room at the Milburns was not big enough for all their possessions, Motoshitsky offered to give a home to his substantial library of almost 2,000 books. Several photographs taken by Jan Oplatka in 1941 show Motoshitsky, her mother, and the Canettis posing in front of Canetti's books, which fill the whole wall, and Motoshitsky's paintings. The relationship between Motoshitsky and Canetti was to move between extreme closeness and dramatic discord. Its ambivalent char character, poignantly captured in self-portrait with Canetti, painted in the 1960s, is evident in the following remarks. While, as we have seen, Canetti was one of her Hauptgötter, she at the same time called him her personal catastrophe. All her life, Motoshitsky suffered from the fact that despite their intimate friendship, she was never allowed to play a prominent role in Canetti's life. Unlike the ups and downs of the relationship, the mutual professional support turned out to be unwavering. Despite the different métier, each was unreservedly convinced of the other's talent. They gave one another the help that was needed to, to enable or facilitate the creation of a work. During the first years of exile, Motoshitsky's financial support was crucial to his survival. Her assistant, assistance lasted for several decades, even though the amounts of money were often relatively small and did not allow Canetti to work free of financial wars for long. Her intellectual contribution to Canetti's work, although at first glance not immediately obvious, must also not be underestimated. They talked about work in progress, discussed the public reception of their work, celebrated their successes, or comforted each other if the reaction had been less, less favorable. 
Sometimes Matuszczycki was directly involved in the creative process. Some of her dreams, which she told Canetti, found their way into his writing. His growing literary success, which followed the publication of Masse und Macht, Crowds and Power, in 1960, was a source of happiness and pride for Matuszczycki. Canetti, in turn, acknowledged that she had contributed much to his work, with which she, quote, will be linked as long as human beings are around, unquote. Similarly, Canetti's influence on Modoshitsky's work cannot be overestimated. Crucially, Canetti believed wholeheartedly in her paintings and frequently expressed his admiration. Quote, you are a very great painter, and whether you want it or not, the world will come to know it. Every picture that you will paint will enter the history of painting, unquote. He sat for a number of portraits, arranged several commissions for Motoshitsky, and commissioned paintings from her himself. His letters are full of encouragement and admonishing advice to create new pictures. Motoshitsky later admitted that she hardly ever painted a picture without eagerly looking forward to the moment when she could show it to Canetti. Despite support from fellow emigres, such as Kokoschka and Canetti, Motoshitsky, having lost the professional networks that might help have helped her art reach a wider audience, had difficulties getting enough exposure for her paintings in exile. Natural reticence, a tendency to dither, an inability to make decisions, and an inborn demand for respect that stemmed from her aristocratic upbringing made it even more difficult for her to assert herself professionally. Besides, there was the problem of her name, which no one was able to spell, let alone pronounce correctly. Throughout her lifetime, various versions of both her Christian names and her surname were used. Motoshitsky herself did not use the aristocratic fon and even left out the hyphen between the first names. In these less than ideal conditions, Motoshitsky, however, managed to have her work shown in her adopted country. During the war, she participated in several exhibitions in London, which more or less openly took a stance against the National Socialist regime. Among them was the exhibition of contemporary continental art at the Leger Gallery in Ju July 1941, in which she was shown alongside Martin Bloch, Georges Prack, Max Ernst, Oskar Kokoschka, Anna Mahler, Pablo Picasso, and Fred Ullmann. The following year, a portrait was included in Exhibition of works by allied artists at the RBA galleries. And in 1943, she became a member of the Artists International Association, which demonstrated against all forms of fascism and strove to forge a link between artists and public by organizing conferences and lectures and staging exhibitions. Towards the end of 1944, the Czechoslovak Institute staged an exhibition that brought together paintings by Motoshitsky with sculptures by Marie Duras. Born in Vienna in 1898, Duras had emigrated to England, now lived also in Amersham, and was a friend of both Canetti and Motoshitsky. Among Duras's work was a portrait head of Motoshitsky. The exhibition catalog contained a foreword by Jan Wazarik, foreign minister of the London-based Czechoslovak government in exile, that highlighted Motoshitsky's passionate search for truth. The exhibition was favorably received. The Sunday Times art critic Eric Newton, a fellow resident of Amersham and the painter himself, expressed his admiration for Motoshitsky's work. The art historian Edith Yapu counted the show at the Czechoslovak Institute among the, quote, outstanding events in the yearly array of London exhibitions, unquote. Probably without Motoshitsky's knowledge, Kokoschka approached John Rosenstein, the director of the Tate Gallery, inquiring if a painting from the exhibition might be accepted by the Tate. Rosenstein drew up a list of five works he was interested in, yet the offer was eventually declined by the Tate's trustees. It would take another 42 years before the first three paintings by Motoshitsky entered the Tate collection in 1986. At the end of the war, Motoshitsky moved back to London, settling in a flat in West Hampstead where, for several years in the 1950s, Canetti also had a room. 
At about the same time, Motschitsky's career took a turn for the better. Following the good reception of her 1939 Dutch exhibition, she had two solo exhibitions in the Netherlands in 1952. She was lauded as a fascinating painter and her work praised for its rare quality. The expressionism was termed gay, honest, problemless, or lyrical and soft. Several reviewers singled out her portraits, which would not easily find their equals in our time. One critic simply exclaimed, quote, that such good painting still exists in our days makes one feel much happier, unquote. By chance, a Beckmann exhibition at the Stedelijk Museum had just finished, which led critics to compare Modeschitzky's work with that of her teacher, concluding that she had arrived at her own personal style that was a softer version of added warmth and humanity. The seal of Dutch approval was the purchase of Finchley Road at night by the Stedelijk Museum. The success of the Dutch exhibitions made Modeschitzky increasingly aware of the struggle to artistically progress in her adopted country. Quote, I myself have exhibited a few times in London, but in spite of positive reviews, I have not had much success. It is a very difficult scene for foreigners, unquote. This statement proved to be true over the following few years. In the 1950s, she only managed to show one painting in London, the still life lobster, in an exhibition celebrating the renaissance of the fish at the Cork Street Gallery, Roland, Browse and Del Banco. Motyshitsky had more success on the continent. In 1954, the Städtische Galerie in Munich put on an exhibition of works by the Bavarian painter Erna Dinklage and Motyshitsky. The opening was packed with old and new admirers of her work, among them Ludwig Baldas and Eberhard Hanfstengel, the directors of major art museums in Vienna and Munich and the Russian writer Fedor Stepun, who had been a friend of her brother and praised her paintings as essential. In 1956, despite struggling professionally in the UK, Motoshitsky decided to stay in the country that had offered her refuge. Having been naturalized in 1948, she finally severed her links with Austria and sold the family estate in Hinterbrühl to Hermann Gmeiner, the founder of the SOS Kinderdorf movement, who proceeded to build one of his villages for orphan children on the site. Montyshitsky was willing to part with her property for a price below the market value in order to give the children a home and to honor her brother. Once the Hinterbrühl complex was fully established, Gmeiner wrote to Montyshitsky, acknowledging her contribution in enabling the creation of, quote, the largest and most beautiful European SOS Kinderdorf, unquote whose model character for villages all over the world was invaluable. In 1961, she erected a monument to Karl in the grounds of the Kinderdorf. Its inscription reads, he perished for the selfless help he granted to the innocently persecuted. Having given up her Austrian base, Montyshitsky would continue to wonder about the pictures she could create in her home city, quote, Vienna is so stimulating for me from an artistic point of view. I have so many ideas. This has to do with the memories of my youth. And nevertheless, I think that I could one day paint my best pictures here." Unquote. For many years to come, she maintained the habit of visiting Vienna every spring and autumn. In 1960, with Henriette still in Amersham, getting frailer, Motyshitsky had to find a new solution to their way of living. She purchased a property in Chesterford Gardens in Hampstead and moved in with her mother. Two small rooms on the top floor were rented out to the Berlin-born Edith Löwenberg, a friend of Erika Mann, the actress and writer and daughter of Thomas Mann. Elias Canetti had moved into a large room on the second floor where part of his library was kept. He loved the house, calling it a Little Paradise, and especially valued the fantastic Biedermeier piece of life there, which enabled him to hide from the world and work undisturbed. To visitors, the house with its old Viennese furniture, its collection of art and artifacts, 
its Viennese cooking, and above all, its inhabitants with their native dialect who maintained a tra traditional way of life, seemed like a relic from a lost world, an Austrian island in an English sea. Beatrice Owen, a friend whose portrait Monschitzky painted in 1973, found in the house, quote, the atmosphere of Central Europe, the elegance and style that was totally natural, the values with which I had grown up. It was a magical household then, always full of the most gifted people of their time, who could forget their fame in Marilouse's company and inspire each other." Unquote. In Hampstead, Modoschitsky became part of a lively intellectual and artistic community. Modoschitsky knew many of her fellow artists in exile, such as the painters Jakob Bornfriend and Hilde Goldschmidt and the sculptors Siegfried Charo and Georg Ehrlich. A close friend was Milan Kosman, born in Gotha in 1921. Her husband, the Viennese musicologist Hans Keller, often provided a sounding board for arguments on the nature of art. The couple are depicted in studio with nude model, practicing their respective professions. For a few years in the early 1960s, Modoschitsky finally seemed to have overcome her reluctance to show and sell her paintings. She found a dealer in Helen Lesore, whose Bozar Gallery in Bruton Place in London had become famous for presenting young artists to a wider audience, as well as showing work of the older, underrated and half forgotten, or the artists appreciated abroad, but not yet in London. The first category probably included Francis Bacon, one of the most important artists with whom Lesor was associated. The second category certainly included Modeschitsky. Lesor staged a solo exhibition for Modeschitsky in 1960 and included her work in several group shows. Among them was an exhibition of the gallery's regulars in 1963, which presented Mother with a Straw in one of the final shows in 1964 before the gallery closed down, entitled Last Anthology where Modeschitsky's paintings hung alongside those of Frank Auerbach, Leon Kossoff, and Walter Sickert. Although she did not find the experience of dealing with a commercial gallery especially daunting, Modeschitsky was still hesitant when it came to giving up pictures. When, in 1965, the gallery closed its doors, she was not overly disappointed, although she vaguely wondered about, quote, never again being able to join in the art scene, unquote. Personal concerns, however, soon took the upper hand. When Weser Canetti died in 1963, Modeschitsky hoped that she would finally be able to become Elias Canetti's wife. Yet, just like her vain longing for Canetti's child, Modeschitsky's wish to marry was never realized, as he had, uh, as, he, sorry, as he did not propose. While she was suffering from his unjustified jealousy, Canetti continued to support her art introducing her to Iris Murdoch. On leaving St. Anne's College to dedicate herself to full-time writing in 1963, Murdoch commissioned Modeschitsky to paint her portrait as a parting gift to the college. She chose Modeschitsky as an artist she personally admired and thought undervalued in this country. With this commission, she hoped to help increase Modeschitsky's reputation and make her more familiar to a wider audience. The portrait, completed the following year, shows the well-known author with an absent, dreamlike expression and a wind-blown air about her. The reception of the portrait was ambiguous. Some viewers felt it did not do justice to the sitter. However, when Murdoch saw the finished portrait, which lacks idealization and does not dwell on the feminine qualities, she found it uncannily accurate, noting in her diary, quote, I think it is wonderful, terrible, so sad and frightening. Me with the demons, how did she know?" Unquote. The first success in Modeschitsky's native country came in 1966, when the Wiener Secession staged a large solar exhibition, which attracted a substantial number of visitors. The guest book contains enthusiastic comments like, Wonderful paintings as one sadly sees so rarely, often singling out the portraits which were considered masterly. Other visitors praised the enchanting poetry and honesty 
of, quote, these strong and pure paintings in which the inexpressible can always be imagined, unquote. Canetti, who had just received the Dichterpreis der Stadt Wien, the poet prize of the city of Vienna, used his increased fame to draw attention to Modeschitzky's exhibition, which included two portraits of him. Critics called it a fascinating surprise and mused that Modeschitzky, quote, had everything been as it should, should long ago have been acknowledged as one of our most important women artists, unquote. The exhibition, brought about the acquisition of works by Modeschitzky by several public Austrian collections. This portrait of Elias Canetti, for example, found a new home in the Historisches Museum der Stadt Wien. The Österreichische Galerie in Belvedere bought Frau Ziegler for 20,000 shillings, a sum that, while relatively small, had a huge significance for Modeschitzky, who wistfully referred to it as, quote, the first money I had earned at 60, unquote and promptly lost it in the telephone box. The exhibition traveled to Linz, Munich and Bremen over the next two years, bringing sales and commissions. Modeschitzky was very pleased with the success of the exhibitions. She could have sold even more, but as her mother put it, quote, she finds it hard or impossible to part with some paintings, unquote. Despite these encouraging signs, Modeschitzky's artistic career in the UK flagged again during the 1970s, when even her submissions to the Royal Academy's summer exhibitions were repeatedly rejected, and her life again was dominated by personal concerns. Sharing a house had created an ever closer bond between daughter and aging mother, yet caring for Oriette often prevented Motoshitsky from painting. In the autumn of 1977, she pleaded in her diary, quote, Mother, unfortunately, often very difficult. Patience, patience. I must love her as long as she is there. Strength, strength, or oh, please strength for the new year, unquote. One way of combining her duty of caring for her mother and carrying on with her work was to use Oriette as a model. Her mother became one of her favorite subjects. Over the years, Modeschitzky produced a series of beautiful and moving images, chronicling her mother's descent into extreme old age. The Sunday Times art critic Marina Vesey called the mother paintings, quote, surely one of the most moving series of portraits to be produced in the post-war period, unquote. And the art historian Ernst Gombrich compared them with the work of Albrecht Dürer, who had immortalized his mother in works of similar detachment. Modeschitzky adopts a distant objectivity and inexorable clarity in her mother pictures that are pa paired with an affirmation of personal dignity and love for her subject matter. The death of her mother in 1978, aged 96, hit Modeschitzky hard, yet she eventually managed to relish the positive consequences. In her diary, she likens the tentative in her, sorry, in her diary, she likens her tentative explorations to the first steps of a newborn alone in the world. By the late 1970s, Modeschitzky had finally also started to come to terms with another bitter blow, Elias Canetti's second marriage and the birth of his daughter, which he had kept secret from her. Modeschitzky's unfailing belief in Canetti's professional ability, however, survived her affront and was finally vindicated in 1981, when he was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature. From the prize money, he repaid some of the debts incurred over the years when he had been dependent on her financial support. Modeschitzky's long-awaited breakthrough in Britain finally came with a major solar exhibition at the Goethe Institute in 1985, initiated by the Viennese author and cultural affairs correspondent in London, for the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, in the Spiel. It assembled 73 paintings from numerous public and private collections or in the artist's possession. The sizable catalogue contained an introduction by Ernst Gombrich, who praised Modeschitzky's artistic independence that made her, quote, incapable of adopting an ism or striking a pose, unquote. The exhibition received universal critical acclaim with major British newspapers and several continental ones publishing glowing reviews. 
Matuszczycki was hailed as a dazzling talent who had been unveiled late in life. One admirer wrote gratefully, quote, I am an ordinary English woman aged 58 who occasionally visits art exhibitions and your paintings meant more to me than I think any other painting ever has. I think they would be just as important to other ordinary folk. I can't thank you enough for the experience you have given me by your works." Unquote. Although the artistic recognition that followed the exhibition at the Goethe Institute did indeed come relatively late in life, Wojciechowski felt no bitterness, but only intense pleasure and satisfaction. In the exhibition's aftermath, she was able to sell a number of paintings, three works representing distinct periods of her oeuvre and the collection of the Tate Gallery. Modzitsky's growing fame was certainly also due to the interest that began to develop in the 1980s in the artists who had fled Nazi-occupied Europe, leading to the inclusion of her work in several exhibitions in Berlin, Oberhausen, Vienna and London that finally presented artists who had been seriously neglected or even virtually forgotten. Artists in exile in Great Britain, 1933 to 1945, shown at the Camden Art Center in 1986, for example, celebrated the, quote, considerable contribution to the cultural and political life of Camden, unquote, that these artists had made. The exhibitions had a lasting influence, especially in Germany and Austria, where the art of emigres started to be recognized. As late as 1992, an exhibition in Berlin entitled Jüdische Lebenswelten, Jewish Worlds, for the first time linked Modeschitzky with Jewishness. It included conversation in the library, her portrait of two Jewish intellectuals, fellow emigres and friends, the poet and anthropologist Franz Bermann Steiner and Elias Canetti. Despite not being a religious person, over the years, Modeschitzky had come to recognize her Jewish heritage. In order to safeguard her artistic legacy, she set up the marie louise von Modeschitzky Charitable Trust in 1992, summing up her reasons in a letter. Quote, I had my first success late, when I was 80. This, however, does not mean that my name is established, that I can ask for high prices. You have to have many exhibitions. There should be a book. I will not live to see this anyway. My earth is small. I gave a lot of time to my mother. Every picture counts. I am only concerned that the work that I have put all my strength into over the last 60 years should not disappear. And also that the image of my mother in the sense of transmitting her memory should remain. The paintings are meaningless when they cannot be seen. I'm concerned that they should live on also physically, that people should be able to see them, that they do not disappear in kitchens, hallways and cellars, and finally in flea markets. Unfortunately, museums are the only place where they are safe. I do not live to see this myself, but I want their future to be secure, just as other people want this for their children." Unquote. Modeschitzky experienced a final triumph in her native Austria, when in 1994, the Österreichische Galerie in Belvedere in Vienna held a retrospective exhibition which established her reputation as an important Austrian painter of the 20th century. 50 works from seven decades were shown, spanning her entire career. The accompanying catalog sold out completely. Reviewers expressed unanimous relief that finally this artist had come home and received the recognition she deserved. The Österreichische Galerie purchased Self-Portrait with Comb, its second Modeschitzky painting, for 300,000 shillings. In acknowledgement of her achievement, she was awarded the Österreichisches Ehrenkreuz für Wissenschaft und Kunst, the Austrian Honorary Cross for Science and Art. Following Modeschitzky's death in 1996, the Marie-Louise Modeschitzky Charitable Trust has been carrying out her wishes. It has published Jill Lloyd's biography, The Undiscovered Expressionist, the catalog resume of her paintings, a collection of aphorisms Canetti had written in 1942, entitled Aufzeichnungen für Marie-Louise, Notes for Marie-Louise, and Liebhaber ohne Adresse, Lover without an Address, a selection of the correspondence between Modeschitzky and Canetti. 
The Trust organized a centenary exhibition shown in Liverpool, Frankfurt, Vienna, Passau and Southampton, and accompanied by a bilingual catalog. Modicicki's works have been included in numerous solo and group exhibitions in Europe and the US. Many paintings have been placed in major collections in Austria, Germany, Ireland, the Netherlands, the UK and the US, through auctions, individual sales and donations. Psychoanalyst, for example, now identified as Ernst Chris, found a new home at the Freud Museum in London. Self-portrait in black, can now be admired at the newly reopened National Portrait Gallery in London, where it joins the portrait of Elias Canetti, presented by Motoshitsky in 1992, in a wish to express her thanks to Britain for giving a home to my mother and me. Motoshitsky's personal papers, photographs, and the great majority of her drawings and sketchbooks were presented to Tate Archive, and the Trust has funded the cataloging and digitization of these items. Further funding supported a display dedicated to Modeschitsky's life and work at the Archive Gallery at Tate Britain in, in 2019-20, which was renamed in her honor. Despite missing many chances to further her career due to the misfortune of exile, not following current artistic trends, a reluctance to part with paintings, a fear to exhibit, devoting a lot of time to her mother, in worrying, about her Canetti, about, in worrying about Canetti, at her death, Modeschitsky could be sure to have painted more than a single good picture. She had in fact managed to lay the foundation stone for her artistic reputation. Since then, the trust she founded has succeeded in ensuring its lasting legacy. Thank you. Amazing lecture. I learned uh, a lot of new things. Um, and I want to actually uh, add that uh, I'm really impressed with the work of the Trust, which um, has achieved so many things, placed, uh, yeah, placed really um, her artwork into museums, has done scholarship, has uh, found home for even her documents, correspondence, and so on, and is now, which I find admirable, uh, is now dissolving itself, uh, not continuing uh, just to continue, uh, but uh, is, is closing down because they uh, basically say that their work is done, which is, uh, I find very, very um, admirable. It's a strong stand. Uh, and. Um, you have been, I don't know whether from the beginning, but you have been extremely involved <laughs> and uh, you're the voice, uh, I, I guess the scholarly voice of, of the trust. And uh, I'm really happy that uh, you agreed to, to speak for, for us today. And now, um, yeah, let me uh, ask again for questions, please, from the audience. Um, Rosemary is actually saying what I love about her work is the fact that you can't pin down a style, although we see signs of the times in which she lived. That keeps her work very fresh for me. So um, yeah, I, I very much agree to that. And um, well, Sandra, Sandra is asking why the Jewish Museum in New York hasn't had a retrospective, uh, but I'm not sure whether you can answer that. That's a question, I guess, for the Jewish Museum in New York. Um, it would be wonderful if she could have one there. Absolutely. Yes, yes. Would be, would be very, very appropriate. Um, and Linda is asking where her birth family's money is coming from. A lot of uh, the male members of the family were bankers. So ma mainly for, from banking, mm -hmm. but, but uh, lots of other professions as well, but, but mainly it, it's banking, yeah. Mm, yeah, uh, and it was her mother's family, right? Not her Yes, um, the father actually was only officially the son of the Hungarian aristocrat. He was really the son of the director of the, um, to his daughter's museum in Vienna. So um, that happened often around that time in Vienna. So, so 
and, and his parents moved away from Vienna to, to escape the scandal, but he, he was only in name uh, Motoshitsky, really. Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it was all uh, Oriette's family's money, absolutely, yes. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And the father and the father was not, um, he died early, right? Yes, um, in 1909, he died early. Yeah, absolutely, an accident. So, um, yeah, he wasn't around for, for very long at all. Mm -hmm. And that's why marie Louise was so close to her mother, because it was always these two. Yeah, yeah. And, um, but there was also the third one, kind of. And Susan is asking, actually, although this is but a biographical detail, I was interested in how they managed to send some of her family's paintings and furniture to England. It, fantastically good question exactly Carl tried to pack up whatever he could um, after his mother and sister had left and um, most everything had to be of course be vetted by, by the authorities and everything was waved through even Marie-Louise's early paintings um, but one painting um, early 16th century um, saint uh, painted on wood was kept back by, by the authorities by the Nazi authorities because they wanted it for their own museums and when Karl was sent to Auschwitz, it was it was taken from him, so it, it was looted and uh, auctioned at the Dorotheum in, in the auction house in Vienna. And then it came to um, Munich, where, where it was bought by a big museum. But the Motoschitskis knew of the whereabouts of, of the painting because a friend had helped in making it come to Bavaria. So after the war, they they got it back. It was restituted um, without many problems, which was quite rare. And the trust has now donated the painting to the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge in, in honor or memory of Karl von Motyszewski, who mm -hmm. had tried to save it, but couldn't. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. That's a very rare story, actually. It <laughs> is. Yes. Motyszewski was in the privileged position to, to know where the painting went because she, she knew everybody along the way. Mm -hmm. So, so, and why she and, and they were rather lenient because Karl had died in Auschwitz. It was specifically stated that the director of the museum, where the painting now was, said, "Please give it back to the family. Yeah, they don't want to yeah. keep it." Yeah, yeah, and probably they had also some some records, right? Yes, uh, because yes. that's always the the issue. Um, exactly. Yes, and <laughs> they could document. Yeah, its passage. Yeah, yeah. So somebody is asking whether the medium pas uh, was pastel. Um, Only in very few um, works of art. Marie-Louise thought she could not draw or she wasn't the draftswoman, but, but she did many, many drawings, of course, and some were pastel. They're, they're absolutely beautiful. I, so, sorry, I didn't show you any, yeah. but they're, they're fantastic. The, the few she made and acknowledged as artworks. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned that a number of factors that prevented her from gaining recognition early in her career. What role did gender play in this reality, do you think? Very good question. Um, I think in, in her case, not that much because she was privileged enough to be taken up by Beckman. In many other cases, that was, of course, an excluding factor. But in her case, she, she, she had support by, by male members and she could paint and draw whatever she and how much she wanted. And she, she was free to do that. So I think it was the other factors more than the fact that she was a woman. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure if, the, if she could have stayed in, in Vienna and uh, in her environment, in the networks that she, um, that she's, uh, uh, that she had, she, it would have been a very different story, like her, her career off in a very different way. She started to make a mark and this uh, self-portrait in the nude is, is very, very courageous to, to put that in an exhibition. So she, she would have, yeah, yeah, carried on, presumably, yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, so uh, can you speak more about the relationship between Elias Canetti, how that impacted her work? Uh, when he wants to ask, who wants to know. That, that was the most important relationship in her life. And although it gave her much happiness at times, it gave her utter misery at many other times. Mm -hmm. So, um, but, but he supported her art unwaveringly throughout the decades. So 
I suppose at, at, on the personal level, he, he was a hindrance, but her art, he always supported. And we've heard the quote, it, it, he really appreciated her and wanted her to succeed. Although he always kept his life rather separate fr from her. And of course, had other, apart from his wife, even other mistresses besides. But, but for Marie-Louise's work, he was crucial. Mm -hmm. And probably on average, Good, <laughs> good for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, and Susan wants to know, I take it there were no descendants? No, no, oh, only wider relatives, yeah, but, but no, no descendants at all, really close relatives. Yeah, and it, it uh, looks like she was pretty much taken by, by Canetti, and so... Um, uh, was her so pursued and since he refused to have a child with her um, uh, that was that was the end of the story for her I guess um, so. in, in Vienna she was very very popular she was utterly stunning and she had she, she had lots of admirers but never never children mm -hmm. yeah yeah um, Sharon says uh, what a fascinating and moving talk. Thank you, Ines. While Marie Louisa acknowledged Britain to have given her and her mother a home, their house in Hampstead as an Austrian island uh, was an Aust Austrian island, and she only got in touch with the family's Jewish identity during the war and on meeting other emigres. Did she always feel like an outcast, or did she feel a sense of belonging later in her life? What a great question. Um I would say she, 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 she was both. She was an insider outsider um, at the same time because she, she was so Austrian and you could hear it in her voice and everything she did uh, it was it was expressed in her whole life. But but she, she had a fantastically good network of fellow emigres and also British supporters. So she, she was both, I think. Uh -huh. Yeah, so yeah. So you must have met her in person. Oh. I only learned of her death which I'm, I'm very sad about. I never met her, but I mean, I've read the archive twice, so I, I know a lot about her, but I, I've never met her in person. <laughs> Unfortunately. Uh, um, so you frequently, uh, frequently reference her diary. How extensive is her writing? Um, she was very ambitious and every year she started a new diary, but then after a few days she gave up. So um, we, it always, in February, I think it basically stops. Um, but but she, she wrote a lot of letters and, and uh, um, other notes. So there's a lot of writing that, that's fantastic to have, have her quotes. And all, all the material now is at the, the Tate archive. So any, and digitized most of it. So it's easy to, to look for yourself if you fancy. Wonderful. Wonderful. And uh, so are you able to, um... Uh, I saw you, I, uh, you know, you, you pu uh, published Canetti's writings about her and, uh, um, and um, are you able, uh, so if they wrote letters, do you, uh, so are you able to kind of follow a conversation in their letters because you have both sides, um, which would be absolutely amazing and so super rare, right? It's almost unique, I suppose, that you have both almost complete sets of letters. And it only happened because Canetti gave back Motoshitsky's letters to her, which to her probably were, was a horrible thing um, after they had, they had their um, little, well, well, not talking in the 1970s, but he gave back her letters to her. So both sides of the correspondence were in Hampstead, which is really almost unique. So, so I, I was so privileged to have, have everything and to be able to match them. So you could really follow the, the, the letter that follows on, on each other, which was fantastic. And it's only, of course, a selection that been published. There are hundreds more, um, so yeah. to give you a little idea. Yeah, wow. That's, <laughs> that is so amazing in itself, right? It's, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I wouldn't want my letters back to uh, yeah. almost any person. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so um uh yeah we have we started late so we have um i would say two uh, 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 two questions uh Alison is asking why do you think she was not successful in the uk after the war one reason is that um her art was just not fashionable anymore after the war um Abstract art became more fashionable, uh, but, but not her, her style of German art anyway, not because um, the connotation with Nazi art and anything realistic was not, not popular at all. So uh, she stood a very, very sl slim chance anyway. Um, and being emigre with, without the networks, um, it didn't help either. So there were many factors and she did never push herself because she just wanted to create new art and, and didn't think about her, her legacy for, for a long, long while, or was too shy to push herself. So, so many factors. Yeah. And just with the help of Hilde Spiel was crucial then, and, and then the, that she managed to make the special the Goethe Institute happen because then for the first time, really large proportion of her works were shown. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And by then you could show really um, realistic art again. And it was not just abstract art that was appreciated. So you just had to take a few decades wait a few decades before that was possible i suppose yeah 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 i think the 80s and the 90s were crucial for for all these you know uprooted artists um, uh, and um yeah and auerbach kossoff i mean to exhibit with auerbach kossoff which was this the same basically also figurative art uh, um, uh, on a pretty high abstraction uh, yeah. level um, and uh, I find, um, by the way, her paintings of her mother deeply touching um, uh, and, and admire the different styles also that she uh, uses to, um, to depict her and yeah. uh, in different moods and different times uh, are quite stunning. And I'm actually wondering, there are, you know, these... Um, there's this animal always, this, uh, what is it? Oh, what's the meaning of the comms that she, <laughs> that she uses, like of the surrounding of the mother? There seem to be quite some items that appear again and again. You're absolutely right. They had three um, greyhounds in a row, um, or whippets, Italian whippets, um, and, and they, they were part of the family. So they always pop up in almost every painting. You're absolutely well, well spotted. There's a Italian whippet. Uh -huh. um, yeah, it's just with Henriette's companion. <laughs> <laughs> that is so amazing. I, I was I was hesitant to, to really identify him. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, Sandra is writing, Ines, uh, I'm an art historian and you must put a, a, a purposely in um, this woman needs to be better known. Um, so yeah, I, I agree. And there are other people who say um, what a wonderful, what a wonderful lecture that was. Thank you so Thank much. You. <laughs>